So I, uh, like he said, I grew up in South Central Nebraska. Um, been hunting ever since I probably could walk. Uh, so you name it, I've probably hunt or caught in my lifetime. Um, but uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to talk about is managing ecosystems to enhance wildlife. Uh, I feel that you know, not just looking at a particular species to attract an animal, but looking at the whole system. And that's what we're here for, for today with the cover crops, not just to benefit our livestock, uh, the livestock in our soil, but also to enhance wildlife and natural habitat that has been degraded over the years. So what is an ecosystem? An ecosystem is a community of living organisms in conjunction with non-living components such as air, water, your typical minerals uh, of their environment interacting in a system. And you can kind of see this is a basic picture that I put up there of what an ecosystem will kind of consist of, um, kind of a basic start. Um, a balanced ecosystem involves solar energy. We have primary producers, uh, grasses, legumes and non-legume forbs. Uh, there's also trees, shrubs that we can also include that in the primary producers, uh, algaes, other uh, producing plants out there that uh, will convert that solar energy into sugars as Keith talked about before. Uh, and primary and secondary consumers follow that. They're going to be eating the forbs, eating the grasses, consuming those species, and the predators are going to be consuming your primary consumer. Uh, and then following, uh, de decomposers, worms, bacteria, uh, fungi. Uh, I am not a soil biologist, so I'm not going to get into the depth of the decomposers. Um, but my primary studies has been with wildlife nutrition, um, which correlates a lot with our livestock nutrition as well out on the landscape. So first question I wanted to bring up is what happens when we remove primary producers? And this is just kind of a basic look at um, the tillage system, high uh, chemical inputs, removing a lot of our species out of, out of the system. So when we remove the primary producers, the plants, the forbs, the grasses, for a certain amount of time, those primary and sed secondary consumers, they get up, they leave. Um, the decomposers, they don't have that option to leave, so they starve out. So. In monocultures, this is another system that we often see in this part of the country, <coughs> for this part of the country, ecosystem bottlenecks is what I call monocultures. And basically what we have here is a big solar unit pr producing a lot of energy, but we only have one species out there that can capture only a certain amount of that energy getting put out. So we have all that energy inflow into the, that primary producer, and we cause a bottleneck or a pinch point on that energy flow through that ecosystem. So with the limited diversity of the primary producers, we limit primary and secondary consumers, so deer, elk, quail, they are only going to be utilizing those areas, those ecosystems, part of the time. The other parts of the time, they're leaving the property, they're going to the neighbors, they may be starving out, uh, they may be more susceptible to uh, more predation. Uh, and then that in turn also uh, limits your decomposers in that property. And, and in that ecosystem. So some of the local ecosystem bottlenecks that we have in this area, uh, I work a lot around Apache, but I travel from Arkansas out to Lubbock, Texas, Panhandle, Texas, a little bit in New Mexico, uh, northern parts of Texas, and some in southern Kansas. Uh, but in general, Oklahoma, Texas, we see a lot of wheat, a lot of cotton, very, very long fallow periods. Pastures and rangeland, uh, typical grassland is probably Bermuda grass or what you would call 
native grass, but it's been sprayed where there's hardly any forbs, hardly any legumes. So it's still a grass monoculture in my mind in that ecosystem. Ponds, rivers, and streams. Those are something that we don't typically talk about in the soil health movement so much. Um, but that pond ecosystem that you manage is a micro ecosystem. And when we have the cattle out on that uh, pasture continuously grazing, they can graze all the pond vegetation off. Um, what's probably the most common thing you see in Oklahoma in ponds? Probably muddy water. And that's because there is no pond vegetation. There's a lot of bank erosion occur occurring. Uh, cloudy water that affects both wildlife performance uh, and livestock performance. So there's been a lot of research done on how how much quality water affects your livestock. So that, in my mind, is also just as important as the top two there. Um, so I did a little bit of a social experiment here. Uh, you guys are all victim falling to uh, my experiment. You're probably wondering who the heck laid out all this odd candy. Um, some guys just received mints. Some people received a diversity of chocolates. I didn't, I wasn't a sucker enough to not give you anything, so you lucked out. But uh, with the mints, you know, we're, we're mimicking monocultures, and you're probably looking around, like, looking at the neighbors, like, wow, I wish I had some chocolates over there. Your wildlife, your livestock, they're doing the same thing. Each one of these tables is an ecosystem. When we have diversity, in that ecosystem, you're pretty content. But when you just had mints and you see everybody's got like a Hershey's bar or a Kiss, you're probably looking over there like, hmm, wish I had that. Uh, Sharon also pointed out at the salad bar, you know, if we just gave you celery, I bet that line would have been pretty short. Um, so, you know, it, it happens all the time with us. and we select for diversity and so that's what the wildlife and livestock really prefer as well. I'm going to talk about two main wildlife uh, for Texas and Oklahoma. That's the northern bob white tail or white white quail, sorry, mixing deer and quail together. Um, and then the white tail deer. So these are these two are probably the most attractive uh, species for wildlife, what people really try to encourage. And I'm going to talk about what they require for a habitat, um, some species that help keep them around, keep populations healthy. So first I'm going to talk about the bobwhite quail. In a healthy ecosystem, breeding can be anywhere from March to October. And that sounds like a big stretch because we hardly ever see quail and coveys small chicks uh, in the later part of that season because primarily because our systems are monoculture long fallow periods going on during that July August September so there's no vegetation there um, but they can produce two or more broods per season or 25 plus chicks per season uh, available water is a large factor with the quail um, but in a healthy ecosystem with growing, living ve vegetation all year round, good diversity in plants, there, you're going to see lower mortality rates uh, on the bobwhite quail. And that just I just put a fact in there that uh, average lifespan of quail is six months only. So when we allow for that system to function normally and healthy, it really expands that lifespan of that quail. When we're in a fallow period, monoculture, they have to move more to find what they need. That really shortens their lifespan down, down and it makes them vulnerable to predation. Um, so in a bottleneck ecosystem, ag land, I used wheat, summer fallow wheat as my example here. Uh, the breeding season squeezes down from March to July because they have no vegetation. They still may breed, but the chicks are going to require living vegetation to get dew off the leaves for water, uh, insects, um, plant materials for 
the adults and juveniles to consume as well. So you're looking at only one brood per season. So that literally cuts your brood numbers in half. Um, so we have no living plants during the summer. They have to migrate to where they can get shade or cover, and your mortality rate becomes a lot higher, and it's been recorded as high as 80% annually in systems like that. As I mentioned, providing food for bobwhite quail, 85% of a juvenile's uh, diet consists of insects. Chicks feed exclusively on insects for the first two weeks. That's very, very important. So if you don't have insects, probably is because you do not have living plants. Um, so you're not gonna end up with the quail or the extra broods in your ecosystem. So during summer, 85% of the adults' food source is green vegetation. Um, in the winter months, they require higher energy to overwinter. They're gonna start uh, feeding more on seeds, weed seeds, small energy seeds such as sesame. Um, but what's really required for quail is green growing vegetation all year round. Oops. So here's a few, few of the food items that I listed. Um, as you can see, insects, wild fruits, cultivated plants, and seeds that they really feed on. Um, I was in one of Alan's fields this summer. Uh, we did have an army worm infestation, and that sounded like a chicken coop walking in into that field because there was tons of quail. So I, I took a stand back and look at, okay, we sp spend how many dollars per year trying to spray army worms as a state or states across the middle of the nation uh, trying to eliminate the pesky army worm when really the answer is in the ecosystem. That ecosystem wasn't quite supporting quail all year round, um, but when the food source uh, showed up, they, the quail really flocked to that field. They came from neighboring fields, and uh, it was really impressive to see. Um, some of the seeds that they're gonna eat, uh, ragweed, Johnson grass, crabgrass, so they also will in a no-till system, you're going to have a lot more seeds exposed for predation by birds. So, and then it's not just quail. I'm talking meadowlarks, songbirds. They all support the same system. So, quail is just a really good example because a lot of people uh, like to hunt them. So, here's a kind of a picture in the background. Quail habitat. They really. Uh, like the edge effect, and I'll talk a little bit more of what the edge effect is in our system. Jimmy Emmons' is, uh, companion strips or your pollinator strips, those are a really good example of an edge effect and why the deer uh, preferred those strips. Um, but for quail, they like 25 to 75 percent of the ground should be shaded at midday. So that eliminates a lot of continuous grazing ground. Why? Continuous grazing ground is not very good habitat for quail. Um, 40, of the, 40 to 70 percent of the so soil surface coverage should be at eight inches or less. That actually should be more, that's a mistake. Um, eight inches or more, so it should be taller. Most of your shade canopy should come from higher than eight inches. Reason for that, that when it's lower than eight inches, Quail can't run through it, they can't escape predators, uh, they become vulnerable. Particular species that rules out is Bermuda grass. You know, Bermuda grass does not support uh, small upland birds, songbirds, meadowlarks. What's probably a big pest of Bermuda grass? Armyworms. And me and Dale, in fact, went over in Arkansas six weeks ago. It was unreal. There was no doves. There was no metal larks. There was no quail that we saw. I think the only thing I saw was a roadrunner standing on a hedge post um, when we were over there. But absolutely no birds. They were spraying for army worms five to six times per year. So that shows an improved variety how it had such an impact on that habitat for quail. You know, so. It's these improved varieties may not be such a great thing because there's this chain reaction occurring in that ecosystem. 
so it dis disrupted a lot of that bird habitat. So good, good brood rearing cover should be anywhere from 16 to 24 inches or taller. That allows them to maneuver easily under the cover. They can duck in and out to get food, um, and it pre prevents predation from hawks. Distance separating food and cover, this is a big one. Um, 90 yards or less. Quail really do not prefer to travel anywhere longer than 100 yards in, in where they have their recommendations of what they need. So if you're in a monoculture, the reason why you never find quail in the middle of a wheat field is because there's not a pond in the middle of the wheat field, there's no weeds, there's no other insects or something like that that they cannot find out in the middle of the wheat field. If you're always harvesting wheat field, and you, you may see quail, but they're always on the edges. And that's because there's a grass strip there's annuals growing there, there may be water nearby, there's trees, there's cover, but in the middle of the wheat field does not support quail system. So that really exposes the middle of your wheat field to armyworms. <coughs> long-term survival in an area with habitat, 5,000 acres for long-term, 10, 10 years or more of guaranteed survival really requires 5,000 acres. And I know what you're all thinking is like, well, I don't have that, you know, it's kind of bad shape for the quail. That's why it's important to get on board with your neighbors, start inviting some of these events, help them realize, you know, they may be tillage people or people that kind of scoff at the cover crop no-till, but there's a big avenue for guys that love wildlife, love seeing the birds, love seeing the deer. This is a great example of why they really need to support the system. So bring your neighbors to events like this. This really helps get everything on board. So 500 birds is kind of a number that has been released um, for long-term survival in an area. This was done, this is a study done in Texas. This has been the decline of the quail population. So you see 1978 uh, to 1988 and 1998. So over time, I find it fascinating that the habitat and the quail populations, along with increased tillage, heavier equipment, higher monoculture, higher input farming, we're also seeing the same. With an increase of that, we're seeing declines on the other end of, of quail populations. So benefits of quail, you know, why, why should we support wildlife or you know, may not be quail, maybe just meadowlarks, songbirds, other things. There's economic returns, you know, hunting, birds watching, and times like now with wheat only being, you know, three, three fifty a bushel. There's you gotta start looking for other opportunities for economic return. Um, I did a quick uh, range. I've seen hunts for quail hundred to five hundred dollars per person. You know, obviously, if you have a good quail population, you want to manage that. You don't want to wipe out your entire population, but still, that allows a little revenue to come in if you're properly supporting the system. Predation on insects, consuming weed seeds, those are other benefits of quail. Um, again, songbirds, meadowlarks, other, other species, this whole system is going to support. So. It's not just quail. You don't have to think that you have to have a quail every 10 foot to control insects. You may have meadowlarks. You may have migrating birds like doves attracted to your fields. So that's kind of it on quail. And next, I'm going to talk a little bit about white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer are a lot more adaptive. Um, their home ranges can vary a lot more, and that's why a lot of people spend tons of money on trying to keep deer on their home range or keeping them on their property. And I hate to say it, I did this too a um, <laughs> long time ago. Uh, my mom convinced me that I wasn't going to make a living at being a professional hunter. So, um, But when I first started out hunting, I was treating wild uh, white-tailed deer as 
as an item, high input item, a lot like the high input livestock systems that we're supporting. And it's really interesting to see if your habitat supports wildlife all year round, that same habitat can also support livestock on a low input basis in the same system. So if your system can, is high input for livestock, you're probably gonna, you're probably not carrying the capacity of, of deer or other species in that system. So deer in a healthy ecosystem, food sources, grasses, lagoons, and non-lagoon forbs, they all range, um, they have a wide range in foods. Uh, but again, green growing plants, high quality forage is all year round is what they really prefer. In a healthy ecosystem, the deer home range is smaller. A uh, healthy habitat supports more deer per square mile. You know, some people see that as a past issue, but some people also see that as a benefit. It, again, economic return on hunting. If you have a lot of deer per square mile, you probably have a healthy ecosystem that you can capitalize on for an economic return. Um, nutrition is maintained all year round. Healthier deer are going to equal larger deer. There's more money in that. So the, the deer industry is a very large in, industry that ranges all over the Midwest. Uh, the Midwest is well known for white-tailed deer hunting. So food sources in a, in a bottleneck ecosystem, uh, wheat, fallow wheat again, something that's very common. Uh, so November to March, April, we have a good food source for deer, not great, limited in diversity. Uh, so they have to find other forbs out there. They have to find legumes and non-legumes. They have to find species that have higher mineral. Trees are dropping their leaves during that time frame. So that's where they're also picking up a lot of their mineral sources on, on dead leaves dropping. So, you know, maybe leaving a, a, a tree strip or a hedgerow and a fence line, leaving some other species on that property can help maintain that diet for the, for the deer. In a bottleneck ecosystem, the home range for deer become larger. That's the big issue that I always had when I was younger is I always saw the deer that I was chasing on the neighbors and uh, I think that's a big problem for a lot of people trying to chase the white tail deer. Um, but once you get into the healthy ecosystem pattern you notice that their zones become much smaller because they don't find the need to travel. So you have less deer per square mile. Uh, deer have, have to find nutrition source while lactating in new anthropology antler growth. That is really big. If you're looking to improve the nutrition of your wild, uh, white-tailed deer herd, that is huge. In the wheat and fallow wheat, most of the nutrition occurs just for overwintering. There is no nutrition in that system for your fawns lactating. They're not getting the mineral consumption um, in the does. And in, in, in return, the fawns aren't getting as healthy as milk. Uh, from the does in that time frame and and also that time frame we're looking at uh, bucks uh, growing new antlers so so essentially you see smaller deer and we also see excessive fawn loss from predation uh, providing food for white-tailed deer white tails this is pretty shocking to me and to a lot of other people uh, white tails will eat 68 percent of their body weight so this is another thing that you might want to figure out that in your system, Jimmy's uh, pollinator strip that we watched or we went to your place, there wasn't much left of that strip. They, I'm, I'm guessing there was probably 10, 10 to 12 deer visiting that strip. Um, on average, one deer will consume about 2,000 pounds of food. So that's, that's pretty large. If you only have one little strip like that and you have a lot of deer in that area, it's not gonna take long for them to figure that out. Um, some of the summer annuals that we typically see uh, for attraction in, to put into that wheat, fallow wheat period 
cow peas, mung beans. Grain sorghum does well. They eat more of the grain at soft dough than they do the actual leaf or grass. Sun hemp, soybeans, lab lab is another one uh, that has been used in the deer market. Winter annuals, triticale, winter oats. Uh, winter oats, I can testify that Alan's been growing winter oats and they, from all the wheat fields around those winter oats, all the deer end up in those winter oats in the middle of the night. So winter oats is a really big one for deer, for nutrition. They will pick it out over wheat um, if you're looking, trying to bring deer in for attraction. Bursim clover is another good one. Uh, in my plots, I saw a lot of deer browse on bursim clovers, winter peas, radishes, turnips, and collards. They're all going to prefer the radishes or the brassica family after a hard freeze when the carbohydrates in the plant turn to sugars. So you'll go from a hot, starchy taste to a sweet taste. And that's what the deer are tasting, and that's what they're going after in the winter time. Also very high in protein. So perennial strips for wildlife. You know, Gabe Brown talks about this. We're running more into this. Uh, not just perennials, but annual strips. Um, they provide the edge effect uh, that wildlife need. Quail, uh, a lot of upland game birds need that edge uh, effect. And what they do is they hunker down in those areas and tr transitional periods uh, or places in your crops. So if you have a pollinator strip going through the middle, that's where they're going to be bedding because they like that transitional period. It makes them less susceptible to uh, coyotes or other predators. Um, some of the species as biennials or perennials, native grasses, legumes, and forbs. Uh, key emphasis on native. Uh, some other improved varieties that we've brought in, alfalfa, white clover, red clover, sanfoin, yellow sweet clover, chicory and plantain, those are some very common ones that people use in perennials and biannual strips. If you're looking at a long-term attraction or pollinator strip, you get several benefits out of that. So what is the edge effect? I mentioned it a couple times, and you can see in this picture, this was right where I have my plot. Uh, this picture is probably taken I'm guessing about August, middle of August. Um, but on the left was I, where I put my winter species for my plot for the people who were at my plot day. On the right was my summer annuals. Um, so edge effects are fence lines, tree lines, grazed versus ungrazed. So you can simply get that edge effect by grazing certain areas and then leaving a tall strip, um, roads, or any other drastic changes. And what deer, quail, other wildlife use is that strip. They can see one way and they know to the back that they're covered. It's hard for them to see. They'll face out. So that's why you're always hard spooking deer when you're walking up to a tree line is because they're using that ed edge effect. It's been found if there is no edge effect or very few edges in a field, fawns are double the chance of getting killed by a coyote than having lots of edges in a field. And the same thing for quail. So they're very important in that system of having transitional periods or transitional lines in that habitat. Top three tips for keeping deer on your property. Maintaining high quality cover and forage all seasons. Sanctuaries, places that you may not travel, uh, may not hunt. Leaving ground untouched is very important and those sanctuaries need to consist of all the all the topics that we talked on what a habitat should contain they shouldn't have to leave out there that really helps that animal feel uh, comfortable and providing greater edge effects on your property these are just some of the benefits and and in a healthy ecosystem that's a very good indicator of a healthy ecosystem if you don't have a healthy ecosystem, you're probably only finding one to two species. If you have a healthy ecosystem, you're probably finding tons and tons of different species, including insects, other wildlife, also predators. With the predators, um, I know have been a big concern for people 
Um, that's not such the case. Does your, does your property have too many predators or does it not have enough habitat to protect, protect the animals there? That's kind of the questions that I ask. Uh, when I look at a property for wildlife. And more often than not, it's the habitat, not too many predators. This is kind of something that I'm gonna end on. Um, I'm keeping it short today, but don't burn your opportunities. I mean, we talked a lot about fallow periods. So many times uh, opportunities are left in the bag, in the seed bag, uh, just wasn't quite committed to something. Uh, you, you say you should have done something and it didn't happen. Well, if you don't do it, it's not going to happen for sure. So don't burn your opportunities. There's a lot of opportunities out there for diversification with your management system, uh, with wildlife, economic returns. Uh, we don't have to be stuck in a, a wheat fallow wheat rotation or just a st straight cotton rotation. There's a lot of opportunities out there. Just you have to seek them. This is my contact info. I also have cards over on the table. Again, I do a lot of work with wildlife plots, uh, studying wildlife uh, with the species, and uh, also on cover crop and grazing management. So that's it. Mm -hmm.